then always in us. Um, so for anyone that's new to Cafe Scientifique, the basic format of tonight's evening is that uh, we're having our very exciting presentation, talk, um, which will last for around about 45 minutes and then we'll have a bit of a break, time for you to, to recharge your glasses, show support for Cafe Boscanova before we all come back to have a bit of a general discussion and ask all the questions that are burning there and hopefully have a bit of debate. Um, it'd be great if you could use social media to please spread the word. Thank you to everyone that has liked our Facebook page. The numbers are going up and up. I'm looking for a random number, but... Uh, 197. 197 followers. So uh, thanks to those of you that are kind of interacting. Um, really, without kind of further ado, I'd really like to introduce you to tonight's speakers who are both colleagues of mine from Bournemouth University. Um, we have Harry Manny, who's a demonstrator and all-round technical guru. Is that a... Uh... Yeah, guru is maybe pushing. <laughs> I do technical things. Excellent, <laughs> fantastic. And Dr Miles Russell, um, who's a senior lecturer and with extensive commercial archaeology experience, and you may also recognise him from media ex um, exposure, I am led to believe. No, no, <laughs> taking a said. Um, and they are both colleagues from the newly formed Faculty of Science and Technology. So, without further ado, I will hand on over. Thank you. Uh, right, uh, what, I wanna, what we want to briefly do tonight is just explain uh, an aspect of our research which we've been conducting over the last two years, really, looking at Roman portraiture, Roman sculptures from Britain. I just want to check before we start, is that all visible? It's a bit, it's a bit blurry where I'm here. That's, that's all reasonably visible to where you are. Fantastic, and you can all hear me. Even better. <laughs> Brilliant. Right, what I'm, so, can I get rid of that one? Can I disappear? <laughs> it was. <laughs> Brilliant. What we've been doing is essentially looking at a, a whole range of uh, Roman portraits recovered from the British Isles. And before I sort of show you some of the results, I think it's important to just to outline the significance of Roman first and second century uh, portraiture. We are so familiar today with statues actually looking like the people they're supposed to represent. You go around uh, town centres, there are Victorian statues to the great and the good, uh, ones put up fairly recently as well. But at the very end of the first century BC in the Roman Empire, this is the first time that people are making statues that actually look like the people they're supposed to be representing. Because much of the Greek portraiture that we see, Greek sculpture and earlier Roman sculpture, you get a stylized image, an image of perfection. Like for example, no one actually knows what Alexander the Great looked like because all the images show him as a very sort of boy-like individual with nice sort of uh, hair like Apollo um, and never aging, never changing, no physical defects. So in the first, at the very end of the first century BC, individuals like Julius Caesar and like Pompey the Great because we are dealing with a time when there's civil war and there's competition between factions in Rome, people are establishing their own distinctive face on coins, so they, their supporters know who they look like, you know, what they look like, they know to whom they're supposed to be supporting. So this would have been relatively startling at the time, but for us it seems you know, quite normal, this is what they look like. So we've got the marble portrait here of uh, Pompey the Great, he's got this very odd sort of, uh, sort of quiff, sort of something about Mary's sort of quiff he's got here, which he has, and he has in his coins as well. I think most of them are creating distinctive aspects about their hairstyle and their face, which makes them uh, unique, which makes them stand out. So he's got this rather bulbous nose, which he has in his coins. Julius Caesar has got his uh, receding hairline. He's got, you can't see too well in that image there, but he's got a very sort of scraggy, almost sort of turkey-like neck. Uh, which he shows. He's got a very prominent Roman nose. We have individuals like Mark Antony, uh, Marcus Antoninus, who's got a very heroic square sort of chin. Um, his neck is, is thicker than his head in most of his portraiture. We can see aspects of his career and life. So here he is in a coin well, it's actually being minted in Rome and he's got a nice distinctive military style Roman hairdo. When he leaves Rome and goes off to Egypt, um, and um, goes off with Cleopatra. He's criticised in Rome for having a very Greek hairdo, for being too un-Roman, too <laughs> Hellenistic. And we can see that in that portrait. He's got this very sort of permed, uh, sort of curly hair, which is distinctly un-Roman. That's exactly what he was being criticised in Rome for. 
We've got Tiberius, um, the second emperor of Rome. He's got a, a very sort of uh, weak chin and mouth, which is distinctive in all his portraits. We can see images of individuals as they age. This is uh, Caracalla, um, an emperor to be aged about 16. There he is uh, aged in his uh, sort of late 20s, and there he is in his uh, sort of mid 30s. And he's got the same distinctive eyes. He's, got, he's always got a very frowning look. He's, he's a particularly unpleasant individual. Um, but we can see him ageing, and that's the beauty of, of Roman realistic portraiture, is once you've identified an individual, you can see different hairstyles, you can see different aspects of their ageing, of their character and their physique. This is one of my sort of favourite set of images. This is uh, Nero. Uh, that's him aged 13, very young and boyish, 19, 20, 24, 27, 29. He's the first person to be unafraid to show his changing sort of body image. He expands quite significantly. I mean, he, he, he dies um, in his early 30s when he, he commits suicide uh, as an enemy of the state. But throughout his portraiture, he's getting ever larger. His hairstyle is getting ever more ornate and intricate. And when you think of this as at a time in the mid first century AD when the bulk of the population in Rome, and Rome's a, a, got a, a city of a million inhabitants at this time, and without across the empire, most of them are sort of borderline starvation. So most people are, are thin, certainly by today's standards. The emperor is unashamed to show himself getting larger and bigger. Here is a man who is quite happily sort of literally eating himself to death. And that shows extravagance, that shows um, the wealth and st the godlike aura of that particular man. But it's very handy for people like us because his portrait changes so drastically. You find a fragment of his image, you can pin it down to a four or five year period of his reign. Some emperors never change once they've established their image. So Augustus, there he is age 16, there he is age 50, there he is age 61. He, he never ages, he never changes. Um, he never loses his hair, you never see lines across the face. He's someone who was, who was very keen to make sure that everyone in the provinces of the Roman Empire, from sort of northern France right the way down to Syria, sees him as this unchanging, almost godlike individual. But he has the same hairdo, he has the same sort of characteristics in the face, we can recognise him again. And the sorts of images that would have been set up in all the towns of the Roman Empire, they're all propaganda images, so they're not, I mean, artistically, they are extremely competent. You know, they're, they're fantastic works of art, but they're, they're rather simplistic in their message. The emperor's always sort of pointing off into the distance or looking fierce and demanding or looking down upon the uh, heads of his, his audience. But again, we've got these recognisable heads inserted into the torso. And it's the same recognisable face appearing on the coinage of the period. Now, the reason we undertook this particular study is it's always been assumed that Britain as a rather distant, almost backward part of the Roman Empire, doesn't have that many portraits in it. Well, we did all the portraits we saw before made out of marble. Britain, of course, hasn't got no source of marble, but we're suggesting, or it's been suggested that images aren't being brought out. It's too far away. It's too distant from the center of empire. People in the provinces probably weren't that interested in what the emperor looked like. In fact, the only two identified images of emperors that are always cited are, there's this one, in the British Museum, which is always thought to be the Emperor Claudius. It's bronze, it was uh, found in the river in East Anglia. And there's this one of the Emperor Hadrian, found in the, in the River Thames. And that's it. But, going through um, museum stores and museum archives, we, it came very clear to us a few years ago, there's a significant number, and this is just a, a, a few of the about, 50 or 60 fragments of images that, that are in various different museums around the country. There's a wealth of portraits in marble and also in limestone, most of which are never on display. There's an image there which is in the stores of the British Museum, that one's in the stores, so's that. Um, that one's been sold to America, that's in um, London Museum stores, that's in Devizes Museum stores. <laughs> Because they're battered and abraded and difficult to identify, museums don't display them. They, they don't interpret, they don't know who they are. So they're never on display. And the more that were found, the more, or more that we uh, identified, the more worried we became that perhaps Britain has actually got quite a few images. It's just that that problem with identification, trying to, to ascertain who they are, means that 
they're, they're overlooked, they're ignored. They're, there's a whole wealth of information out there that's never been properly assessed. So we effectively undertook the beginning of a, a pilot project which we sort of uh, discussed as the Imperial Image Database, going around and trying to set up the idea of, of scanning complete portraits and using those, so it generate a database of Imperial portraits and use this to compare with damaged or fragmentary Romano British images because a lot of the British ones are in a terrible state. They've been smashed up, they've been reused, they've been dumped as hardcore somewhere. So that they're not in the nice pristine state that a lot of uh, continental examples are. And so we wanted to build up a complete set of images and use the fragmentary ones to compare because they all seem to be realistic portraits of real individuals. Did you want to say something about the, hmm. the scanning? Which one's are they? That's, that's the pointy pointy. That's the turny turny. <laughs> oh, I see. <laughs> okay. So when we started this project, we had a discussion about really how we were going to capture an image so we could then study it further to perhaps reinterpret it or reassess the, um, uh, the, the, the portraiture in the, in the stores. Um, traditionally, the portraits have been photographed and archived and indexed and were sometimes published in tomes which no one really ever read or were, um, were put on shelves and they were very worthy bits of work, but actually not very well. Um, people didn't really look through them, uh, coffee, coffee top uh, books, uh, coffee table books. So what we wanted to do was actually move away from tr traditional black and white photography and actually look at a more interactive way of recording um, the, the portraits. And so what we decided to um, use is actually a 3D laser scanner. Um, and a, this is an image um, of our laser scanner, which we used. In fact, we've had in the department since about 2000. And the technology came out of engineering, really, from rapid prototyping and reverse engineering um, components for nuclear power stations and really important things in industry. But gradually, um, from about 2000, the technology and the hardware became a bit more affordable, so more public institutions like museums and universities could actually buy this technology and then start to use it for more novel um, uh, reasons, really. And the museums, actually, surprisingly enough, were actually quite active in laser scanning and recording objects, artefacts, bones, um, in our case, portraits. So we decided that actually this was probably a really good way of <laughs> of beginning to record some of these portraits so we can actually begin to look at in much more detail any damage, any uh, features on the portraits so, actually see, so we can compare them to other known examples. And the way a laser scanner works is really quite well, it's not simple but it's very um, effective in the sense that it reflects a red laser from a prism onto a surface and that laser is then reflected back onto a sensor and essentially it's a form of triangulation the time taken for the um, laser to leave the instrument hit the surface and be reflected back and the angles it's reflected back at allows um, after a lot of uh, complex trigonomet tri trigonometry and maths to actually produce a three-dimensional mesh of the surface of an object and um, here we go, you can see the red laser going across the face here. Essentially, a whole scan would take about three seconds. And we can get a scan um, point density, so we've got a measured point every 0.3 millimetres across that surface. So in about two or three seconds, we can uh, collect about 30,000 individual XYZ points, so three-dimensional points in space. And what we can do then is rotate the object, rescan, rotate the object again, rescan, and we can scan the object from basically as many angles as possible. So we can then build up by overlapping those individual scans a composite model. And at the end of that process, we probably end up with a scan, uh, what we call a point cloud, so a whole um, cloud of individual three dimensional points with nearing a million points within there. So it's a fantastically detailed um, data set which we can then begin to analyse much more scientifically, if you like, than just looking at a black and white photograph with all the um, 
vagaries of distortion and so on. So it actually opens up a whole new wealth of information so we can actually take some uh, very precise, very accurate measurements, we can uh, shine a theoretical light over the surface of the um, scan data to allow us to pick up very, very subtle humps and bumps and so on. All these little identifiable features which helps us then compare it to um, known portraits. So we can take an unknown scan of ours and compare it to, um, to potentially uh, something which, is, um, which we know is identifiable. Also, we can begin to look at any damage or any potential damage may, which may have occurred um, immediately after a statue goes into the ground or before it goes into the ground um, and begin to then sort of tease out a story, uh, sort of like a post-mortem story if you like, after that um, portrait has been taken down from its public display and then we can begin to build up a little bit of a life history really and begin to almost tell a story about why some certain objects or portraits have become um, damaged. And also as well, um, being part of the academic community, we'd like to um, talk about our research and present it to the public. And by 3D laser scanning, we can also publish our um, 3D models online and other people can then look at it and move it around and distort it, um, move the uh, light, theoretical light source, take measurements and so on. And so it becomes a lot more um, publicly engaged and research does. It becomes a lot more what we call citizen science, really. Other people are getting involved in that and can sort of comment on it and say, okay, well, it looks like this, or have you considered this? So it becomes a lot more of an interactive um, uh, process, really. We're not just saying, this is this, take it as read. So the, um, so the laser scanning has really opened up a whole wealth of opportunities um, for us to capture data, analyse data, and then present and publish data. It also allows me to um, showcase my array of striker jumpers, um, <laughs> which I do seem to have in all these slides. <laughs> and I'm wearing one today as well, which is uh, unusual. Anyway, back to Miles, I think, so we can continue our Thank scanning you. journey. I just, oh, I just quickly flip back to the one that Harry was on. I just also, you know, as Harry was saying, the good thing about scanning is it's a nice objective picture of an image. Cameras, all cameras distort an image. Um, also, when you're looking at material in a, in a glass case, as this particular object was, it's very difficult to get an idea of it. Um, it's also because this particular artefact has been very badly burnt when it was in the ground, you've got this big dis disfiguring burn down one side, which really catches the eye uh, and, and also further distorts the image. On the scan, you get none of that. You just get um, a, a full idea of what that particular person looked like. I'll just run through Harry's jumpers again. <laughs> so, Fishbourne. What's the first site that we? I'll just give you just a, a sort of a, a taste of a few of the the pieces that, that we've looked at. This is one of the first we examined um, because it was found in 1964. And if you've ever been to Fishbourne Roman Palace Museum uh, in West Sussex, just near Chichester, it, it's a very it's, well, it's, it's a lifelike fragment of a head of a of a young boy, probably aged about 12, 13, 14. So it's a small fragment. It's hidden sort of about this high in a case. So most children pass by without seeing it. Uh, most adults ignore it because they want off to go and look at the mosaics and then go to the gift shop. Um, so it, it's a much underlooked piece. But examining it, or just, just carefully looking at it, it, it's quite clear. It's very well manufactured. It's a lifelike image. It's made of Italian marble. So therefore, presumably, it is of someone important. It is of someone of wealth. And what we wanted to do was to, to try and scan it to get a better idea of what it looked like face on, away from uh, photographic distortion, and away from the sort of disfiguring burn and smash down it. Did you want to yeah. spin around? So, what we've got here is um, a quite scaled down, or um, we reduced the point cloud resolution in this, um, in this 3D scan, but essentially we can now produce 3D PDFs. So we've got the 3D data, we can add that to a PDF, and then it's quite easy to publish. But because of the limitations of the 3D, um, uh, sorry, the, the PDF process, we've had to reduce down the data quite a lot. So when we analyze this data on our, on our computers, actually the, the detail is a, a bit more, um, is a bit clearer. But what we've got here essentially is the results of our first scanning foray. You can see we can actually begin from the sort of traditional view. I think the huge amount is something like this. Yes, isn't it? Yeah. So we can actually begin to see it how we how it should have been displayed originally. Um, 
I think that's, that's also one of the points is all the photographs and the way it's displayed, you only see it in three feet, uh, in three quarter view. You never see it from face on or from profile. And certainly profile is the way you can best identify a particular individual. Uh, and from face on, we can map sort of key aspects of the position of the eyes, nose and mouth. So we can only really do that once we've got our, our 3D image to play with. So as I was saying, we could scan all the way around the sides and also at the back as well. And I don't know if you noticed on the um, photograph Mars had, it's actually glued rather unfortunately onto a Perspex mounting um, <laughs> stand. So that's what this um, rather spiky data is here. We sort of had to scan, scan that initially and then remove the data and then artificially fill the holes. But if we continue around, you can begin to see the other side. You can see, begin to see the cheek, the nose profile as well. And then intriguingly, on the top, I can just angle this slightly so it's not too much light on there. You can begin to see um, some form of keyholes, really, on the top here. So once we've got the 3D data, you can actually begin to see this in a completely different way to how it was displayed. You begin to understand how it would have looked when it was formally on display um, 2,000 years ago. Um, as I was saying earlier as well, you can change that. Uh, ah, change the light settings as well. So you can change the light shining on there, so the strength of the light and so on. And you can see as I do that, you can see different aspects, different bits of detail showing up. And again, that just helps us to, to understand a little bit more about how this um, or what kind of message this portrait was supposed to be um, giving out? What was it of great importance? So I'll flip it back onto the original sort of landscape. Yeah. Oh, no, lights have gone out. There we are. I think one of the first things that, that struck us is, I mean, obviously everyone's known for some time. It's, it's a very badly fragmented image, but one of the things that first picked up on the 3D scan is the fragmentations being caused by someone wielding an axe. There's a great big axe blow down here across the chin. There's another one that struck the nose. Um, there's a one that's, that's hit just above the eyes there and has, has fragmented the image. There's about six or seven uh, separate blows with an axe has broken that into pieces. Somebody either didn't like that person <laughs> or was very keen to turn it into rock. It was actually found in the, in the foundation trenches of a, a slightly later Roman building, a building that dates about AD 90. So this was obviously earlier than that and related to a statue that had probably been taken down and broken up when the new building was created. So we'll just flip it back to the, uh, his, his sloping head. This strange sort of slice at the top with the key marks in is presumably when that someone was actually creating that image they ran out of marble. There wasn't quite enough marble to finish the piece. So a separate bit of the, the crown on the top of the head might have been slotted into place there, or you might have had a, a plaster sort of fragment on the top there, which, which adds the forehead and the hair. And we'll flip around to sort of the profile. The other thing that hadn't been noticed before is that, I mean, we've got the hair curling around the ear up here, but that little bit of that sort of excrescence sticking out there, and this line up there, that's part of a laurel wreath. So that's not actually the hairstyle, that's actually something, a, a victor's crown, a victor's wreath that's actually standing on, on top of this chap. Now, in the first century AD, only the emperor or a member of the imperial family is allowed to wear a laurel wreath. It's become a, a symbol of, of the imperial family. Um, so no other statue, no other image of anyone should be allowed to wear that. This was always thought to be perhaps the owner of the, the Roman building at, at Fishbourne, or his son, or some perhaps Romano Britain who, who lived there. But the fact it's wearing a laurel wreath suggests that it's not, but it's actually probably a representational image of someone who was very close to the emperor. I'm going to flick it onto the next slide. Here's another fragment of a statue. This one's from Syracuse uh, in Sicily. It's, it too has been smashed with an axe. It too is of a, a, a youngish man, someone in his mid teens. It too is wearing a laurel wreath. There are portraits which really represent the best match for this particular chap with regard to the position of the eyes, the hair, um, and the actual sort of general characteristics of the face. Some of them have been smashed. That one's been hit with a hammer um, across the face and had that fragment, uh, that nose and part of the chin removed. That one's relatively intact, as is this one. 
and there's sort of the, the face on image there. Again, we can see that these more complete examples have got a very clear V-shaped hairstyle parting at the front, which of course we haven't got in our instance, but we've got the same sort of base, almost pouting lips uh, and the same position of the eyes throughout. Basically what we're looking at in all, in all those images is the Emperor Nero in his first phase, created when he was about uh, 13 in AD 50. It's when he's adopted by the Emperor Claudius to be the heir apparent, to be the next emperor. And we're so used to seeing Nero as this sort of bit big, bloated madman, you know, you see Quo Vardis or any of those sort of uh, films, uh, Peter Ustinov, he, he's always um, this really rather sort of corpulent and, and utterly insane individual. You forget <laughs> that he was a, a young man once. And these are the images, there's uh, one from Parma in Italy, there's one from uh, in Paris, uh, there's another one which is uh, now in, in America. Of Nero, aged 13, at the time he's being adopted, they're showing him as a, as a young man, almost a, a senator or a, a magistrate in training. These are the things that would have been disseminated through the Roman Empire to say, this is your next emperor, this is your next leader. So they're sort of key places in, in towns around the Roman Empire. And that looks like what we've actually got at Fishbourne. So it's moved away from being the son of an unknown villa owner to the heir of the Roman Empire. And the reason that it's probably been smashed is that in AD 68, when Nero commits suicide, he's already been noted as an enemy of the state. Um, he's been hounded, he's been chased by the Roman Senate. They feel he's too degenerate, he's too uh, difficult an individual. They want to get rid of him and replace him with somebody else. And after he dies, we get damnatio memoria, which is really the, the eradication of memory. It's to make people non-persons, a very sort of Orwellian idea that someone is erased from history. You take their name off inscriptions, you smash their sculptures, you hide them, you forget they were ever there. And that's what's happened to these examples. You can see someone's battered this with a, a chisel or a hammer across the face to eradicate it and then take it off the statue. That's been decapitated and smashed. And it's quite likely what we're seeing with our statue from West Sussex. It too has been removed forcibly with an axe, fragmented into pieces, and then dumped in the rubble of a later building. That's an entirely appropriate uh, sort of uh, way of dealing with Nero, um, as was felt by the Roman population. The second head we looked at is this one. Uh, this is from Hinckley, uh, just north of Leicester, now in Leicester Museum. You can see from the photographs how very badly abraded it is. By eye, looking at that, you can see aspects of the hair, you can see where the eyes and nose and mouth are, little drill holes here on the sides of the mouth, but you can appreciate why this is just cited as unknown man, and it's sometimes on display, uh, more often than not it's in stores, and here it is in one of, one of the sort of back rooms of uh, Leicester Museum. You're not wearing a striper jacket. No, no, no. <laughs> um, so they were scanning. It's, it's quite a nice one to scan because it, it's, it's, a, it's a lifelike piece. Um, it's relatively intact as far as you know. So we can put it on that turntable and spin it around. Cue It's a bigger file. Yeah, it is a, a bigger file um, because it is a much larger object, so therefore it's more data in there. Um, again, it's been reduced down, so it has lost a little bit of detail, but it does look a bit rough because the actual original object is rough because it's a, a sort of native lime, native limestone. It is. Yeah, a native limestone. So that was heavily weathered, heavily pitted, and been subjected to um, sort of it had been in soil for sort of nearly two thousand years, so therefore it's been quite badly um, damaged. You'll probably notice as well that we've excluded the, um, the shoulders. That was an artificial mount, really. So um, we've actually taken that away because, again, the eye is drawn to that and you can begin to look at, um, look at it slightly differently. So we've actually managed to exclude that data. Um, and what we're left with then, as I say, is just, just the head itself. And when we start looking at that, we can actually, when we compare that to photographs, actually begin to pick out quite a lot of detail regarding the hair and actually Yes, the face is damaged, but side on, you can begin to again pick out some certain features which we're beginning to see across a lot of our um, portraits which we're beginning to study, um, some certain similar hairstyles and so on. I think the other good thing to sort of notice is, do you want us to spin him slightly around the other way? 
is as you're going around the face, the face is very heavily abraded, the back of the head less so. In fact, there are very distinct, these aren't uh, geological aspects, these are actual discrete hammer blows. We've got a mass of blows around the face, around the cheeks, around the eyes. They extend almost to the ear and down the front of the face. There's one or two around the back, but there's actually relatively few. The hair there is just, just naturally weathered after 2,000 years of, of, of exposure. So the real focus of damage is to the face. It's almost again that, that someone has taken great exception to that portrait and has attempted to obliterate it. And they've done a very good job, to be honest, because you, know, you see it in the museum today, you, you can't see these features at all. But having scanned it, as Harry said, we can see the hair, we can see the way it's combed back around the, the nape of the neck, we can see all that styles and we can match him with uh, other examples. Back to the fit, sir. Thank you. And the best match that we've got, um, the interesting thing is when you're actually looking at the, the image, the hairline's actually down to, to here. So we've got hair parted. It looks like it's got a very high forehead, but it's not actually <laughs> coming down to, to this point. Um, but it's very, it's smashed up with the hammer. But looking at the position of the eyes, um, looking at the position of the mouth and so on, we've got, and also the way that the hair is combed down and back, on like that there, our best match again is Nero, perhaps unsurprising given the, 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 the deliberate defacement um, to the face. So this is Nero uh, at the time he becomes emperor, age 17 in, in AD 54. Quite what it's doing um, in the middle of nowhere, it's not associated with any other Roman settlement, it's just an isolated find. So it may be it belonged to a statue, possibly in Leicester itself as, as a Roman town, it's been smashed off, they've taken it a very long way from any settlement and then they've dumped it as far away um, as possible from anything. And these are other images of Nero at the same time, you can see again hammer blows to the face, real disfiguring marks there, knocking the nose off, disfiguring the face, trying to obliterate his identity. So even in a province as far away from Rome as Britain, there is a real outpouring of anger to this particular, I mean you still see, obviously see it today, you see what's going on in Ukraine with statues of, of Lenin. Um, you saw it in Libya uh, with statues of, of Colonel Gaddafi um, in Iraq with Saddam Hussein. You can't get to the person, but there's a real outpouring of anger against images of that individual. So certainly decapitation, perhaps use as trophies, smashing up. There's a, a real sense of perhaps years or outpouring of, of hatred against that person to try and obliterate their identity, trying to hurt their image or trying to hurt them perhaps through their, their statues. There's an even more weathered example um, in the stores at the Museum of London. Again, found quite a distance from the Roman city. The face is almost weathered smooth. The hair is uh, relatively nicely preserved, but that's unidentified. You get to see it's not a different scene, that jump. <laughs> but you can see the kind of glamorous locations that we get to do our scanning in. This is where the hair is stored in the rubbish collection area of uh, London Museum. So it's it's. It, but then, you know, it, it's, it's an unknown piece. Um, there's no, been no attempt to identify it, so it, it's just hidden away down there. You can see how extensively weathered that is. You've lost all the facial features there. Nice on yeah, so that, this side here says much more weather than this side. But again, you can just begin to see on the back here again, uh, elements of the hairstyle. Um, and this is probably the best preserved bit, so it does indicate it was sort of maybe buried face down, side face down. Um, and the back has been essentially quite well, relatively well preserved. And on this side, we begin to see elements of a, um, a distinctive hairstyle as well, which we see in. Um, well, I'll let Mars talk about the session. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, let it's, the cat at the back. It's, it, it's, it's a very distinctive hairstyle. It's drawn up. Um, Romans had good use of sort of hair gel and, and curling tongs, so they created a whole range of uh, ornate hairstyles. But this one, you've got almost a ridge coming down that side there, round the side of the head, and it, it, it's quite a, a chunky face. Do you want to move on to the? Yeah. 
So yeah, perhaps given the title of a lecture, it's unsurprising that this is actually another portrait of Neo. This is this is the more recognisable individual. This is the, the the sort of the Hollywood version of Nero as the man who, who burnt Rome. You can see on his portraiture there from about AD 59, he's got that raised hair, and it gets bigger and bigger as he goes on. You can see it certainly on his coinage, um, and we, it's very clearly on here. He's the only person in the first century AD and for much of the second century who has that distinctive style. Once he's been damned, uh, and consigned to oblivion, no emperor would dare have that, that sort of hairstyle again, no one would dare sort of compare themselves to Nero. So it's another sort of uh, link with the man, and perhaps also the, the weathering, the battering that, that is evident on here, the obliteration of that face is another part of this uh, damnatio. I'll just <laughs> make the point as well, the, this is an image from the scan itself, from the um, raw data effectively, so nearly a million points in that. Um, that scan data set, the, the 3D model you were looking at probably had about um, 200,000 points in there. So effectively that's why it looked a lot coarser and a lot more blocky. But actually when we do the analysis we're actually dealing with um, these images here. So actually you can pull out a lot of detail from there. The one intriguing thing perhaps about Britain is not just the fact that perhaps images of Nero were obliterated after his death. We've got a little minor incident that occurs in AD 60 which is uh, Queen Boudicca, or, or Boudicca as she used to be referred to. There's a big rebellion in the eastern part of the island. Colchester, London, St Albans, Silchester, Winchester, all burnt to the ground, and something like 80,000 Roman citizens die in one of the biggest uprisings against the Roman state. <coughs> AD 60 is when Nero is in power, so it, it's just possible that these images that we've seen of the man, they're all pre-date <coughs> AD 60, so from Leicestershire, from London, from Fishbourne, it's possible these don't relate to the period that he was damned. This might relate to that popular uprising against the imperial system, against the emperor, against Nero, uh, and that these are trophies of war. Things that have been hacked down from their position have been smashed and therefore have been later dumped in some kind of uh, British ritual fervour. I just quickly I appreciate our time. I'll just quickly run through these, these last two. This is the um, bronze statue, if you go to the British Museum today, still labelled as the Emperor Claudius, Nero's predecessor, the man who invaded Britain, not by himself, but the man who, who, who ordered the invasion of Britain in AD 43. Uh, when you compare the scan with images of Claudius, it's quite apparent that they're, they're not the same person. Mm -hmm. um, with regard to the nose, the shape of the, the chin, sort of receding there, the very sort of smaller um, forehead, the nature of the skull shape and the hair, everything. I don't, never know why that was identified as Claudius in the first place. It quite clearly is not that man. It is Nero again. It's our, if we've gone from having no images of Nero in Britain to, to at least four. Uh, and the thing really about this particular statue, it's been distorted. The back of the head has been very badly damaged. It is a bronze hollow cast statue. Uh, it's been distorted by someone trying to decapitate it. There's about, uh, I think it's about 13 separate axe blows or, or adze blows to the side of the head. It's been knocked onto its right hand side. Someone's basically stood on it and then with an axe has smacked down on it and then has wrenched it to the right and off. So it's been slightly distorted in that process, but it is certainly Nero in uh, AD 54 at the time. You can see better on, on this photo. There are massive axe blows there. So this could also be an image of the hated emperor, either destroyed after his death or destroyed during the uprising of the Boudican Revolt in AD 60. And I'll sort of end with our last discovery, or our last major one we've had a chance to try and mesh the scan together. This is a almost two and a half times life-size head, uh, made of marble, found in Bosham, just south of Chichester. It is very badly eroded, very extremely badly weathered, it's hidden away in uh, one side of, of Chichester Museum. It was then consigned to the stores. We did the scan, identified it. It's now been taken out of the stores. It's one of the, <laughs> it's one of the few examples, a little minor victory. It's one of the few examples of, of what of these heads actually now being put on prominent display and interpreted. What it actually is, it's not Nero, you'd be surprised to hear. It's the Emperor Trajan. Um, Trajan is emperor. He's the emperor before Hadrian. Uh, the emperor who comes to Britain and builds the wall and defines barbarians from, from Romans. 
So this is a, a monumental image of the emperor. You can see its position where it was in the museum at the time meant that we couldn't scan the chin and we couldn't scan the back of the head. But there's enough there with the position of the hair, the position of the eyes, the nose, the mouth to identify. And Trajan's also the last emperor for 150 years not to have a beard. Hadrian sets the, the precedent of, of big sort of uh, bushy philosopher's beard. And from that period onwards, for the next century and a half, every emperor's got a beard. So this is a, a clean-shaven individual, which, which cuts down the, uh, the possible candidates entirely. But it's uh, looking at the, the nature of the hair, the forehead, the eyes, and so on, it, it is quite clearly Trajan. And the thing is, the best comparison for it, um, this one, is in Ostia. It's, it's the port for Rome in central Italy. This is a two and a half times life-size statue of Trajan made of exactly the same marble, put up by the Emperor Hadrian after Trajan's dead. So it's, it's a monumental image of his predecessor. And it was set up in, that's not Ostia Harbour, that's Bosom Harbour in, in Sussex. <laughs> but it was set up in the harbour there. And it's quite likely that our battered example of a statue was also <coughs> set up in Bosom. And if you go to Bosom today, it's a fairly sleepy uh, little village. They filmed a few midsummer murders there. It gives you a sort of an idea of the, uh, the nature of the, the town. There's little hints of Roman archaeology in and around the church and under the houses, but a monumental statue of an emperor in this area close to the church suggests that there probably is quite a substantial harbour. Um, there's probably sort of a monumental, a monumental temple and other sort of buildings around here. So part of our question is if that is um, a portrait of Trajan as we believe, where's the rest of him for a start? <laughs> where's his arms, legs and torso? Uh, and where's the building that originally he stood at to. Why was it this harbour selected? Why is this harbour important? Is it one of the key harbours of Roman Britain? So it's giving us a, a wholly new different sort of angle on this particular site. These are some of the examples we started with. Um, these are sort of further examples that we're looking at. We're going to try and scan and identify. There's both male and female examples here. It's a, a twice life-size female portrait uh, probably of, of an empress or, or one of the imperial family in the late first century AD. And it's just the tip of the iceberg with regard to, to Roman portraits in Britain. And hopefully our survey will not just identify them, put a context on them, but give back a, a missing part um, of Romano-British history. There were portraits of emperors in Britain, it's just that they're badly damaged uh, and they've been hidden away from view. Um, we've started publishing some of them. If you go on the internet archaeology, it's open access on the internet, you can see our, our first article, Finding Nero, where there are some of the scans which you can play around with and fiddle around and flip about. We've published in the Journal of Roman Archaeology in Britannia, but you'd appreciate there's a lot of scans to, to, to do and to complete and mesh together, together with our normal job. Um, <laughs> so uh, we'll be sort of putting out articles, I think two or three a year, hopefully, uh, until we've, we've gone through them all and hopefully uh, replace a missing part of uh, British history. Thank you.